So imagine this. You get a phone call from an attorney, and the attorney says to you, hey, listen, doc, I'm not representing a guy who, well, he committed a few murders, it looks like. And then here comes the question, or at least it's supposed to sound like a question. So, Doc, I need you to evaluate this guy. Now, look, he's crazy. You'll see that. But, you know, you decide. That's your job. But when you see the crime scene photos and you hear what he's done, well, you're going to find that he's out of his mind. And, uh, but, again, that's your job. So welcome to my world. I'm a forensic neuropsychologist. In the trade, I'm called an expert witness. I'm asked to examine individuals who have been accused of committing the most violent forms of human behavior, murder, terrorism, sex offenses. I'm asked to explain the unimaginable, the unthinkable, the strange. I'm asked to explain these things to judges and juries. And here's the weird part, I do it. I go into federal courts, district courts, superior courts, and I tell people what my understanding of what happened on those very dark moments of life. So I hope by now you're starting to think of a few questions, like, how is that guy up there possibly right? And more important, what if he's wrong? What if his opinion leads to someone getting out back into the community and committing another violent act? What if he's wrong? And unfortunately, you probably have some history to rely on to make that assumption. There was an expert psychiatrist in Texas in the 70s who was well known for spending 15 or 20 minutes evaluating these individuals, these defendants. And then he would testify in court that he was 100% certain of his findings. And his findings were usually that the guy's a psychopath, unredeemable, and if you let him back into the community, he's going to create murder and mayhem for sure. This went on for a long time, even though everybody in Texas knew about this guy. And it wasn't until 20 years later that he was sanctioned by professional bodies. There was something about that 100% certainty that felt pretty good to judges and juries. Now, it wasn't that long ago that in courts around the country, experts were asked to give their opinion about risk for future violence. Who was going to commit another violent act? What we found out, we found out they were, they were right about 50% of the time. That means if you were carrying one of these things, it's a quarter, it's a coin. If you had one of these things, you could be as accurate as those experts were just by flipping a coin. I know, I'm making a pretty good case for my existence in court right now, aren't I? <clears throat> but let's talk about a, some of the ground rules that I operate in in the courtroom. You see, in court, there is no verdict that says you are found innocent. You're found not guilty. And that's an important distinction. A defendant once said that you must rise above the facts to find the truth. Verdicts are not about truth. They're about who wins or loses a case that day. And along those lines, as an expert witness, the courts are very clear about this. I don't have to be 100% certain. Case law is clear about that. Case law says that the only thing I have to do is say that my opinion is valid based on my education and experience. The courts say, in other words, that I have to give you my best hopefully, educated guess. The courts say that I have to be a clinician. They don't expect me to be a magician. I don't have to come up with things. I can tell you about my limitations. Now, with that air of uncertainty that I have going into the courtroom, you can imagine that 
cross-examining attorneys love to ask me this question, they ask it over and over again in as many ways as they can. Hey, Dr. Mendoza, isn't it possible that you're wrong? My answer is always, yeah, it is. So before you pull the trap door on me completely, let's talk about science. It's a funny thing. Let's say you go to your primary care physician, your doctor, and she says to you, well, I've gone over all the lab results, and you have this exotic disease. And if you don't take this medication, you are going to die. <laughs> but then she says to you, uh, but I might be wrong about that. <laughs> now, <clears throat> you really didn't want to hear that part, did you, if you're the person? But you're still going to take the medication. Overwhelmingly, even though you know your doctor can be wrong, you still take their advice. You see, that's how science works. We use terms like standard error of measurement, confidence intervals. We use these terms because we know that our data has limitations. There is an uncertainty to the science. We know our data is not 100% correct. But for some reason, that lack of certainty feels much worse when I say it in court than when your physician tells you in, in her office. So, I evaluated a man one time who was accused and found guilty of murdering his father. He killed his father, took the body and contorted it and dismembered it in a way so that it would fit into a plastic storage bin. And then he took the storage bin and he put it on the porch of another relative. Is there anything that I can tell you that is going to be emotionally satisfying, even if I tell you the mental illness had a substantial role in what happened in that murder? Or like the doctor in Texas, would you prefer that I tell you I'm 100% certain? Would you feel better about that? The reality is there are certain cases that it doesn't matter what any expert says, the case is going to go a certain way, and we know that. So what do we do? I'm telling you I can be uncertain, and you should be happy with that. The courts say it's okay, but we have victims and lives that are shattered. What do we do about that? Fortunately, the answer came in with each one of you. You. You, the jury, are the counterbalance to everything that happens in the courtroom. See, the expert's role is very limited. The courts require that I tell you, based on my education and experience, that this is my opinion. I tell you the limitations of the data, and then I leave the case with you, the jury. I'm not responsible for bad outcomes, outcomes that the public can't live with. You decide, you the jury, what's good science and not good science. You decide what that balance is. You, us, in all of our, of our irrational fears, our contradictions, us, our little complicated selves, are actually the people best suited to deal with these complicated human factors. Why? Precisely because we are irrational, contradictory, complicated selves. It makes us the best people to be able to make those decisions in a courtroom. Now, you may be saying, you may be saying this is pretty complicated stuff. Maybe we should get some help. So we look to technology. It's what we always do these days. And we hear words like machine learning and artificial intelligence. And yes, those things have done amazing things for our lives and will continue to do so, I'm sure. I am not confident, however, that they understand the kind of human experience that we're talking about in the cases that I deal with. 
let me, uh, let me give you an example. I've been hired to work on a number of serial murder cases. I have listened to an excruciating detail. Murders, moment by moment as they occurred. I have heard about the moment when that thin veil between life and death is torn. It is a unique and humbling experience. I've heard the defendants talk about their chaotic minds and how they've been that way for so many years of their life, but no one ever saw it, no one ever noticed. I hear about their obsessive thoughts building up in the days leading up to the murders. I hear about the impulses, these irresistible feelings to commit these murders during the murder itself. I am not certain that we have created an artificial intelligence to appreciate and weigh that kind of human experience. As daunting as it sounds for you, you are still the people best suited to do that, and that's coming from an expert. I trust your opinion, you should trust your opinion. So, what about my dilemma? What if I'm wrong? What if my opinion, in fact, does lead to someone going back into the community and harming another individual? Professionally, I'll tell you what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna continue to go into courtrooms, I'm gonna continue to tell good people like you that based on my education and experience, that my opinion is scientifically valid. I'm gonna to continue to do my job. I'm, I'm going to continue to show up in court. Personally, how do I deal with this? What if I'm wrong? How do I sleep at night? Well, I suppose it's possible that having a small glass of whiskey with a good friend might help. And maybe having that friend tell me I'm not a despicable, horrible person. But what really helps is knowing that I was true to the science. I made my case, I told you about the limitations, I told you that based on my education and experience, that this is what I believe occurred. And then I leave it with the jury, I walk out, and I will sleep well at night. But what about the images of these victims, the stories of shattered lives. Has that changed me? Absolutely, how could it not? But I wanna leave you with another part of the story. I have evaluated many other people who have never been accused of murder, terrorism, or sex offenses. I have evaluated many people who had mental illness, honest to goodness, diagnosable mental illness. I've evaluated these people. I have heard their stories. I've listened to them. They tell me about how they get up in the morning and against all odds, they go into the world without much social support, without much financial assistance, fighting against a failing mental health system. They struggle, they endure, they persist. I am inspired by those stories. Despite everything that I have seen and heard in my career, I continue to believe that people are good. And in those moments of crises, in those dark moments when people have to make critical decisions, tough choices, that they will rise above their worst impulses. They will rise above those impulses and they will achieve greatness. Maybe not the kind of greatness 
that puts them on the cover of a magazine or newspaper, but the kind of greatness that's demonstrated by the simple act of reaching out one's hand to help somebody else. People are good. We are all a work in progress, I get that. But people are good. And of that, my friends, based on my education and experience, I am 100% certain. Thank you.